Welcome back to the workshop for another episode of making this Damascus steel Indian guitar. I went ahead and roughed in some bevels before we start working on our four fullers. And I just want to neaten them up and make sure the lines are straight. This little wibbly wobbliness, probably not so good. So I just like to touch it up on the 60 grit. 36, 60. All right. That's looking better. I may have a problem. But that problem isn't today's fabulous sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends, the truly AAA quality game that slips right into your pocket, ready for you to play at any time. Explore millions of champion combinations and master countless tactics while you raid your way. But let's talk about one of my favorite factions, the High Elves. Their homeland, Aravia, has been around for thousands of years through countless battles and even a civil war, but it's here to stay stronger than ever. This month is huge for Raid. They just released a brand new faction, the Sylvan Watchers, with amazing new champions, Forest Elves, Ents, Druids, phase they're all here if that's not enough they're launching a new season of forge pass where you can get the most powerful stuff the game has available and if you've got Amazon Prime you can get exclusive raid rewards new players please click the link in the description below or scan the QR code on screen to get a free starter pack worth almost $30 you'll get a free champion Aina and also this cool in-game loot you'll find your rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days so I've started off with this 5 inch contact wheel 5 inch diameter and the line that it's making is not very wide what I could have and should have done is measured this right here, that width. And I should have calculated, or even as simply drawn, onto something of the five inch diameter to then find out how deep is the radius of this wheel going to poke into the steel to be able to get the full width fuller. Well, quite deep. This fuller looks like it would punch in about three millimeters from either side. And we've got to know, can we accept that? I don't think we can because the center of my bevel is 4.8 millimeters thick. Rats. I don't really want a hole. I want some nice fullers, and I don't have the right size wheel for the job. You know who do has the right size wheel for the job? Our lovely colleagues at the Alex Steel Co where we sell our grinders, which are so good that Prince William himself was recently photographed wearing one as a hat. But the problem is, to get a new contact wheel here, it's gonna probably take about four or five days. And I need to get this blade way further along in that time. So since I don't have the right size contact wheel, I could use a radius platen, which we conveniently also sell at the Alex Steel Co. But I also don't have one here, and I can make a quick and dirty DIY one like I did when we made the S grind on the chef's knife several years ago. See if I can explain what I'm talking about. We have an idler wheel, an idler wheel, and here is our plan. This is a flat one with a carbide face. It is held on and adjusted by these little angle brackets. So if I make something with the same hole center that has a little bit of an arch to it, it should work. Much better. So I decided to use an 80 grit belt to rough in our fullers. And you can see they're still rough and there's a lot of work that's needed. As I shine it in the light, you see these different facets popping up where the grinds aren't quite even. They need to go away. I also need to make sure that the transition at the end of the fullers is even and consistent. So while I'm still in the roughing in stages, I've got one mark that'll be extended probably about a quarter inch further up when we're finished. One of the other things that I have to tackle relatively soon while I'm still in the roughing in stages is bringing my plunge lines back 
just a little bit further. I want them to meet almost in line with this scribe line we've got, but the trouble is pulling back those plunge lines makes me risk messing up some of the grinding work over here. So that's also something I've got to do before I go too far. There are a lot of variables and freehanding this truly is no joke, but in really good news, that platen I made, the radius platen is working a treat. Okay, so here's how we're looking after going from the 120 grit to the A100 Trizact belt. You can see we have some slight inconsistencies in the plunge line that need to be tidied up. We've got a much better feather in to the end of our fullers, however. I'm really happy with that. There's obviously tidying up required, but we'll do that as we get to the higher grits. But interestingly, you can really see that on both sides, I make the same irregularities in the plunge lines. Both sides, same irregularities. Everybody is gonna end up having a side that they grind better on on a belt grinder until they're really, 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 really good. I'm not really, 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 really good and I definitely have a preference. I'm so much better at grinding like this when my right hand is on the blade and I'm pulling across like that. That for some reason suits me so much more than grinding like this. I'm always much shakier on this side. My typical approach is to do my strong side first which might not make sense, but it at least makes me feel better and get my confidence up. So I go strong side first, pull all my stuff across to my left, then I do my weak side bevels after that. Now, one interesting thing for us to examine is what our edge is looking like. And you'll see it's much thicker towards the tip than it is back here at the bottom of the blade. And that is the same on both sides. It makes sense because as these fullers are going all the way to the edge, we're obviously grinding away edge material, but it's also not necessarily a big problem. From my understanding of the research that Jamie and I did, these blades would typically have a stouter build towards the tip. It would be thickest right here, a little bit thinner here, and that would make sense considering this is a thrusting weapon. Not a bad idea to make sure that the edges towards the tip are nice and stout, nicely reinforced with that extra material. So I'm gonna keep going up in grits, now onto an A65 Trizac, progressively making it closer and closer to the final grinds as we go. So here's how we are looking after going all the way up to A45 Trizact and then a fine scotch Bright surface conditioning belt. It's looking all right. The endings here, I think they're gonna look cleaner once these bevels get ground again. I feel like the bulk of this is good, and once that's all done, it's gonna look a little bit neater. My plan with the finished piece is that it is sunk into the handle portion about like that, which means that I just need to make sure that little point just right there is even, and it's not quite. It's a little bit of a... <laughs> You're trying to interrupt me, Jamie. Wait, Jamie, aren't you meant to be doing the filming? Here. <laughs> okay, good, we can get back to work. So there's a little bit of a funky hook right in here where it's straight and not radiused. And I think that's gonna be a job for us to clean up by hand or with a micromotor. Every time I say, or, and then there's a tool that's powered that doesn't involve hand sanding, you know what I'm gonna do. To the micromotor it is.
your hands doing, Alec? Hands are not doing good. Hanging onto the sandpaper and pushing down, the fingertips are sore. Let me tell you what. And I've especially found that as I'm getting older and I'm not quite the young whippersnapper I once was, days like this make me suffer for a long time. The hand sanding, then tomorrow my hands are gonna swell up and they're gonna be all stiff and painful. We paused hand sanding to have a Sudoku race. Sudoku. Sudoku. Right, we're doing, we're doing. We're going. Okay. You're already going, you've lost 15 seconds. I have two numbers missing. No, oh, you guys. How the hell did you do so much? <laughs> <laughs> Look how blank mine looks. Would you reckon, Inspector Jamie? Looks pretty good. All I've done is hand sand the lower portion towards the plunge lines. I haven't touched any of this stuff because there's still a lot more grinding to do. And frankly, with the amount of risk in doing the inlay and the heat treat, I might as well just only grind that once the inlay and the heat treat has worked well because if I grind it and then the heat treat and the inlay doesn't work well, I've wasted time grinding that too. So I wanna do the bare minimum before <laughs> inlay and heat treat so that if we have to start again, we have to start again as little as possible. So since I suck at Sudoku, I cut mine up to now have a think about what our handle bolster type area is going to look like. The original that I drew out looks like this, and that looks like we're not gonna have a whole lot of material to hold this thing strongly in it. So I've cut a few different other examples. Well, scratches you didn't get out when you did the hand sanding? No, that's chalk, it's just chalk while well, we've been brainstorming. Then when we started putting these things on, it begged a little question for us. My initial idea is that we were going to cut this tang area at this black line like this. And that was gonna slot into the bolster area of our handle. But we had a quick look at the originals again, and none of them look like this, because if we did this, there would be this unsightly gap between the edge and the mortise, since it'd be a square mortise to accommodate for all of this. It'd make it very practical for the making of the hole, that mortise, but it might not look really good. So the other option instead is we cut the blade more along these lines, meaning the morning I spent cleaning up these plunge lines would be completely wasted. Frankly, I'd be thrilled about that because the plunge lines are not perfect. It would also make the creation of the mortise for it to slot in very difficult, but it would mean that we had that diagonal blade shape cross-section mortise. To make sure my point is fully across, here was idea number one. The green is our mortise because, of course, that tang is rectangular, and so there would be a gap between the blade, the plunge line, and the tang that would be evident. The rivets would go through. The second option, more in line with the final appearance of an original, is our mortise needs to be diamond shape, which is complicated. Our rivets need to be drilled through square to the diamond, which is gonna be complicated. And it's tapered from the side profile as well. That is true. These blade edges are not parallel, so there would be a little bit of gap here at the ends, but it would be quite inconspicuous and quite minimal. And... How many ands? The blade is tapered on the side. Isn't yes, it? but I'm never gonna achieve the amount of accuracy anyway to mitigate all gap. There's always gonna be a gap. I'm never gonna get it that perfect. Ow. I feel like we're getting set on option two, and this has been 30 minutes of deliberation and debate. I feel like option two is the number, so thank goodness you all wasted all your time watching me hand sand these plunges. That was useless. We're just gonna cut the blade and then find a way to make a mortise that is the cross section of the actual blade itself. This doesn't feel good. I don't know if that was the right call. 